Yeah. How do I get it onto? So if we presented you. Yeah. You can minimize that screen. Yeah. You can you can green minimize the screen. And if you just go play from start, this should work. But you can minimize that screen. Okay. Turn that off. And I'm just gonna let some people in. Yeah. Feel free to Thanks. Hi guys. So I'm I'm Vivian. Um, I'm one of the final years. Um, I'll be taking you guys through dermatology today. Um, most of the content will be relevant for GP. Um, but there is also a little bit of paediatric derm um, in the slides as well. So, um, and also if you guys know any of the rashes, just feel free to shout out um, what you think the diagnosis is. So I think we'll just get straight into it. So I've divided up the lecture into the following topics. Firstly, dermatitis, um, which is just from like highest yield to lowest, I guess. So dermatitis, acne and rosacea, psoriasis, infections, um, which is a huge component. You've got your bacterial, viral, um, fungal, and also infestations as well. Um, and then finally, a little bit on benign and malignant um, skin tumours. So dermatitis. So with eczema, um, you can divide it according to whether it's exogenous or endogenous. Um, I would probably know the conditions on the most of the most of the conditions listed there, at least be able to recognize the rash. Um, for your OSCEs, you'll probably only have to know atopic dermatitis in detail, but definitely be able to still spot diagnose any of those rashes up there. All right, so does anyone know what this is? Okay. Anyone want to shout it out? <laughs> Someone probably knows. <laughs> so, um, well, does anyone want to give a go at describing the rash that they see? So I won't go through too much on the descriptive terminology today, but um, I guess you can sort of see a bilateral, um, poorly defined erythematous rash. Um, on the top one in the left-hand corner, it's located behind the pop um, behind the popliteal fossa, so in the flexures, um, and you've got these erythematous small papules there. So um, I think this is quite characteristic of atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is um, something that you guys should know quite well for your GP OSCE stations. Um, it's good to be able to give a quick definition um, in, in layman's terms to the patient. So it's a chronic condition, um, something that they'll probably have for a long period of time um, and they'll continue to have sensitive skin even after it resolves. Um, that fluctuates, so it's relapsing and remitting. You've got these acute flares and then often after treatment you go into remission, but then you might get an acute flare, um, say, a few months down the track. The prevalence is quite um, frequent, it's quite common, so about 5 to 15% of children and 2 to 10% of adults. Um, and it's associated with other atopic diseases. So if you do get a history or um, a proper station where you have to ask the child a few questions or the mother, um, you can ask about these other atopic diseases as well, see whether they're well controlled um, and see if he does have those conditions in association. Um, in terms of the etiology and the pathogenesis, it's multifactorial. So essentially um, a, a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Um, but um, ultimately it's due to like a, a defect in the epidermal um, layer of the skin um, that predisposes um, the child to be more susceptible to irritants and infections. Um, and so then you've got this penetration of exogenous agents such as allergens and irritants into the skin and that mounts an immune response and they get um, quite pruritic lesions and that erythematous rash afterwards. Um, in terms of the genetics, there are a lot of genes that they're investigating that have a sort of relationship to eczema. The most um, substantial one though is this filagrin gene and the mutation essentially alters the aggregation of keratin in the layer and that affects the um, epidermal 
layer and the function of the barrier in the skin. So there are different forms of atopic dermatitis. Um, probably the most common one would be your childhood um, AD, but um, you should also know about the other ones because they present often in different locations. So with infantile atopic dermatitis, that's normally in a baby um, in the first six months and usually affects the head and the neck more. Whereas in your childhood one, you'll see that in the, classically in the flexures that you hear about. And then in adults, it can occur in a wider range of locations. So flexures, head and neck, but also trunk and limbs as well. And if you do get it in your um, adulthood, either in your 20s or 30s, you probably also had it when you were a child. Um, in terms of the rash, so be able to know the classic description and be able to describe it. So a uh, pruritic erythematous rash characterised by papules, um, patches or vesicles. Um, there might be excoriations as well, so scratch marks, might be um, some erosions as well, so that's just when the superficial layer of the skin, the epidermis, is denuded. In chronic atopic dermatitis, so in a kid who's had it for a long time, you'll probably see lichenification, which is essentially thickening of the skin, um, and you might see further excoriations and hyper or hyperpigmentation as a result. So management. Um, you would go through your personal and lifestyle factors first. So essentially you want to reduce anything that could aggravate the skin. So that means using soap-free washes, um, using um, maybe so soft cotton um, clothes or towels instead of uh, anything rough like sheepskin, avoiding um, carpet, grass, sand. Um, you need to use regular emollients and moisturisers and the theory behind that is that it will help break that um, itch and scratch cycle and help um, sort of um, build up that epidermal barrier layer that in a child with eczema is quite deficient. Um, you want to try not to scratch, um, try keep the nails short and sedating antihistamines at night. So that's um, both sedating to help them go to sleep but antihistamines to help the pruritus. Um, so when they come in with an acute flare, the first thing to rule out is any secondary infection because you don't want to be applying topical steroids or any topical um, immunosuppressants or immunomodulators on top of that infection. So you can do a quick skin swab um, looking for a bacterial source. Um, the other sign of infection would be crusting, um, bulla formation, weeping. So if you see any of those um, sort of yellowy crusts on top of the rash, then you also suspect that it's got a secondary infection. And in that situation, you need to give the child, so either topical antibiotics, um, or if it's very severe and extensive, then you would go oral. Um, so after you've treated the infection, um, you wanna go and treat the flare with um, topical steroids. So topical steroids are um, a really good way to induce remission. And essentially, you want to treat all the areas which are erythematous. Um, so you would tell the patient to apply the topical steroid, um, so like daily, um, until the skin clears. Um, and this can probably go on for maybe seven to 10 days. Um, make sure that they do <coughs> continue to apply it throughout all the areas, um, because if you treat less than that, then it's more likely for them to go get another acute flare. So it's better to actually get it completely clear first. Um, and additionally, if you find that the topical steroids aren't sufficient, you can also use modified dressings. So these are things like wet dressings where um, you apply the topical steroid, but then you apply the sort of moist, occlusive bandage around that area. And essentially that's going to help increase absorption. Um, and once you've um, treated the flare, long term, you want to continue the moisturisers. You would use emollients as well during that flare period, but it's really important long term to keep um, using the moisturisers. Some people say that you can also use a topical immunomodulator. Um, so whether it be topical um, and any of the immunomodulators like um, pimacrolimus um, to continue to suppress the, um, the flare. And in that way, you're also using a steroid sparing technique. Um, and then if it's really severe, you can consider phototherapy. Um, so oral immunomodulators like methotrexate, cyclosporin, azathioprine, 
or even biologic agents. Um, but in that situation, you probably just, um, you would want to let them know you have those options. And if that's the case in a GP station, the ZAG can refer or write your referral letter to a dermatologist. Um, so in terms of what potency of topical steroid to choose, essentially you have to look at the location and then you determine how thin or thick the skin is within that location, how sensitive it is. So if it's in a really sensitive area, like say the face, um, the genitals, the flexures, then you would go for a milder potency topical steroid. Whereas if, um, if it's just sort of a moderate area, um, trunk and limbs, just moderate potency. If it's in an area of thicker skin, so that's probably like your elbows, your palms, your soles, then you would um, increase the potency and go um, potent to very potent, depending on how thick the skin is. <clears throat> um, it's necessary also to know like the side effects. Patients often come in quite worried about the use of topical steroids long term because um, they worry about systemic absorption. So if you at least, you know, know the side effects, you can tell them that these are the risks um, and it also addresses their concern about systemic absorption, then they can feel a little bit um, more educated in their use um, and you can allay their fears. So essentially with the side effects, um, there are some, so skin atrophy, including striae, you might then get a bit of skin thinning, visible veins, bruising. If you apply it um, on your face, particularly if you've got like underlying rosacea, um, then it can cause perioral dermatitis. Um, if you apply it on your eyelids, it can cause um, glaucoma, cataracts. Um, other things include like irritation and stinging, erythema, telangiectasia. It's important also um, that you know the diagnosis is atopic um, dermatitis and not something like tinea because if you apply topical steroids on tinea, it often changes the appearance and makes it even more difficult to diagnose um, and that results in tinea incognito. Um, and then systemic absorption, I think it's around 10%, which is still fairly low. Um, and you let them know that once they've treated the acute flare, they would just stop the topical steroid. So that can help decrease that systemic absorption. Um, in terms of complications, um, it's actually quite a good idea to know what the images look like for each one. So secondary bacterial infection, the impetigenization, uh, as I mentioned before, would present with crusted um, erosions, bullae formation, um, and you get these yellow crusts generally on the areas where it's erythematous already. Um, eczema hepaticum, which is um, the image displayed. So that's when you have um, secondary infection with HSV. Erythroderma, that's essentially like a rash covering more, uh, or an erythematous rash covering more than 90% of the, like the whole body. It's a dermatological emergency um, and can cause like hypothermia and severe organ failure, including cardiac failure, um, but it's quite rare. And allergic contact dermatitis, which is a nice thing to tell the patients if they do have severe atopic dermatitis, that if they're thinking of careers further down the track, such as farming, hairdressing, cleaning, um, in those sort of careers, they're actually at an increased risk of developing allergic contact dermatitis. Um, and so if they, they should probably avoid those careers. Otherwise, if they do develop it, um, and they're in that pathway, like it sort of really limits them. They'll have to probably change careers. So those are the main complications to be aware of. Um, any takers for this rash? Yep, seborrheic dermatitis. So classically you've got um, the one in like babies where you sort of see like this cradle cap appearance. Then you've also got um, the type in adolescence where there's more crusting, um, scaling around the eyebrows. So it's quite common again, um, and it's a chronic form of eczema. Um, normally affects the scalp and the face. So that's the main characteristic feature of sebderm. Two forms, as I mentioned before, you've got the infantile form, um, and babies. it affects babies less than three months, but generally sort of resolves around six to 12 months. And then you've got the adult form, which is uh, more persistent, and it starts in late adolescence. Um, Similar to your uh, atopic dermatitis, the exact or underlying reason or cause is not fully understood. 
Um, but there has been a role of malassezia yeasts um, that's been recently said to be involved. So in terms of the clinical features, um, characteristically scalp, so just think if any, if it's sort of a crusty scaly rash in the scalp, you need to think about symptom. Um, but it can also affect the chest, the presternal region, the upper arm and the flexures. Um, so on the scalp, it presents as itchy, diffuse scaling on an erythematous background. On the face, you've got scaly erythema in the nasal, nasolabial folds and also on the forehead, eyebrows and beard area. And classically, like eyebrows and scaling between the eyebrows, you generally associate with septum. Um, lesions on the chest are often marginated and then flexural involvement can produce this sort of moist glazed erythema. Um, and it also has an association with blepharitis as well. So in terms of management, um, general measures, so you would choose like a wash containing keratolytics, normally salicylic acid, and that will help you remove the scale and the keratin. You can also let them know they can use medicated shampoos, um, which contain selenium sulfide that helps to target the malassezia yeast that were implicated in the etiology. Um, topical agents, very similar to atopic dermatitis, except you've also got the additional use of topical A fungals, antifungals. So topical steroids, as I mentioned before, topical antifungals to control the malassezia yeasts, and then topical tar can be used as well. Um, and in severe or resistant cases, you would either use oral antifungals or maybe tetracyclines and phototherapy. Hmm, any ideas? Yep, this code eczema. So this one's a little bit different from the other forms of eczema in that the lesions are more clearly defined. And you've got these classical um, numular lesions. They're often very um, itchy, like intensely pruritic. Um, so it's characterised by intensely pruritic, scattered, well demarcated, as opposed to the other ones which are generally poorly demarcated, numular areas of exuding and um, crusting erythema. It only affects the trunk and the limbs. Um, causes unknown, unfortunately. Um, so management, again, potent topical steroids. This one, you can actually inject the steroids into the lesion as well, um, particularly if the lesion is already lichenified, because if you if it's intensely um, pruritic, it's more likely to cause that lichenifica lichenification earlier. Then um, similar to your other forms of atopic dermatitis, you'd use emollients, you'd use oral antihistamines, um, phototherapy, wet dressings, treat any bacterial infection, um, and if severe, you can consider oral steroids and immunomodulators. So we're still on eczema, um, and this one's one that um, occurs quite acutely and is generally localised on the hands. Yeah, pump flicks. So this one, you get these um, vesicles, um, bullae, that often because you're using your hands, they'll burst. Um, the trigger is unknown, but the episodes tend to occur quite acutely, and it can be severely um, debilitating given that it is occurring on the hands. So you've got these crops of deep-seated blisters on the palms and soles. Um, vesicles are extremely itchy on the lateral sides of the fingers and palms. And the heel was scaling. Scar scaling. Um, may involve distal finger and cause paronychia, which is essentially a infection around the nail bed. Um, treatment, so again, potent topical steroids. So you just want to um, try to reduce the flare as quick as possible. And uh, similar to the other ones, you would use, um, you know, wet dressings, emollients, cold packs, protective gloves. Um, you should probably tell them to keep the hands protected for three months or so afterwards. Um, so that the, their skin can fully recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, more for symptomatic treatment. Yeah. yeah. Can you use that for the other ones as well? Um, well probably, know. but this one is like severely pruritic, so I think that's why um, it's been included for this. Okay. So if you can't see properly, that area looks a little bit hypopigmented. Mm -hmm. 
I, I didn't hear the second part. <laughs> um, so we're still on eczema, still on like eczema. Is there a pityriasis or something that is? Yeah, yeah, pityriasis alba. So generally like a low grade form of eczema. Um, it's a common cause of hyperpigmentation in children. Um, and it's most obvious in darker skin um, children or like say if children have been out um, and they've suddenly gone, gotten a tan, then you can recognize the hyperpigmentation a bit more easily. So um, children prevalence is around 5% and as I mentioned before, mostly children less than 16 years old. Um, so clinical features, you get these areas of a patchy depigmentation and fine scaling as well. Um, itch in this type of eczema is actually quite minimal um, and as I mentioned before, it, it will be made more obvious after sun exposure, which can often be how they, how they write it in the exam question or in the STEM. So management, again, mild topical steroids and moisturizers. I think this would, so this is something similar to like a complication of eczema or constant scratching. Yeah, like canification. Um, and in this situation, it's actually, the condition is called lichen simplex chronicus. Um, it's also known as a neurodermatitis, where the patient finds that area very itchy and so continually itches that area and that just, that creates that severe cycle that can't be break, broken. And essentially a localised area of chronic lichenified eczema um, and it presents as either single or multiple plaques. The location, um, so it's not random, it's often in areas where it's easier to itch. Um, so back of the scalp, the neck, um, lower legs in particular, and generally a solitary unilateral pluck. Um, so you've got different causes of the primary itch, whether it be atopic eczema, contact, dermatitis, psoriasis, and insect bite or neuropathy. Um, but ultimately that constant itching prompts um, the lichenification of that area. Um, and because it's really severely itchy, like your discoid eczema, you would treat with potent topical steroids, steroid injections as well. Uh, then you've got the other ones, moisturizers, antihistamines, cooling creams containing menthol, and make sure you treat the primary condition that is actually causing the itch. So this is the hand in a machine tool operator. Someone who's using machinery constantly. And it would develop progressively over a period of time. Yep. Yep, so we're moving on to the exogenous ones, irritant contact dermatitis. Um, so irritant contact dermatitis is often due to environmental irritants um, and it will develop over a period of time. It's often due to repeated exposure to that irritant. Um, so common irritants include um, cold water, so ha hairdressing, mechanics, they're often the occupations that are at risk, acids, alkalis, detergents, solvents, adhesives, friction. So a lot of your common um, irritants that you find every, in everyday life. Occupation, so as I mentioned before, it's cleaners, hairdressers, food handlers. Um, and it's in terms of contact dermatitis, it's probably the most common cause. So you've got 80% um, less of the allergic contact dermatitis. Um, clinical features, so erythema, scaling, fissures on the dorsal and palmar surfaces of the hands. And generally, it affects the hands because that's what's going to be in contact with the irritant the most. And you might also have some swelling and blistering as well. So treatment is actually quite difficult because you have to remove the irritant. And often if it's something that they have to encounter every day in their occupation, that's going to um, make their job harder. So it's actually quite, um, in, in theory, it's easy, but practically speaking, a little bit difficult. But you would protect the hands, you know, with gloves. You would tell them to have regular application of emollients as well. So this is in the shape of a band-aid or an adhesive placed on the skin. Yeah, I'd heard allergic contact dermatitis. 
So allergic contact dermatitis is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, so the delayed type. Um, and the difference between allergic and irritant is that it's no longer due to repeated exposure that develops over time. It's more the body's own um, immune response to it. Um, frequent causes, probably the main one is nickel, but you've also got these other ones as well. And all of those causes are tested on patch testing where they give a standard panel of the most common um, allergens um, applied to the back. And then they look at which reaction um, is most severe. So treatment, you would want to identify the allergen with patch testing. Treat the active dermatitis as normally, like with topical steroids and emollients, and then try to avoid contact with the allergen. Often that means a change in career. All right, so we'll move on to acne and rosacea. So um, fairly straightforward. Acne vulgaris. So, wait, so acne vulgaris essentially, it's a disease of the pilosebaceous unit. Um, there are many different or multiple reasons why this occurs, but essentially in terms of the pathogenesis um, it involves the hypokeratinization around that hair follicle. It involves the um, bacteria, um, propio and the bacterium um, around that hair follicle to, to multiply and then um, essentially inflammation around that area developing a papule. And if it um, breaks, then you'll get pus formation um, and cysts as well. So you've got different forms of it. Um, normally, I think just be aware of the infantile and juvenile forms, especially for peds, um, which you see in small babies, three to 12 months old, but it will resolve by four to five years. Um, and classically, it's the one we all know, it's the one in adolescence. Um, but you've also got this late onset type, which develops after your 20s. And in that type, it's important to exclude PCOS in, in females. Um, severe, so... That's normally you can have a couple of nodules and cysts in your plain normal um, acne, but if you've got a lot of them, then um, they count that as um, acne conglobata. And if you've got systemic symptoms, so joint pain, fever, um, then you can actually get acne fulminans. So I sort of touched on the pathogenesis before, um, but the hyperkeratinization around the hair follicle, which blocks it up increased sebum production by the androgen hormones, which is why you probably don't see acne as commonly in postmenopausal women because they don't have that um, hormonal stimulation. Proliferation of that bacterium, um, accumulation of the shed corneocytes, the sebum, the bacteria leading to rupture, and then that leads to dermal inflammation and the development of papules. Distribution, so normally on the face, but also on the posterior neck, is upper back, anterior chest and shoulders. And you normally upper back, anterior chest and shoulders will be when it's more severe. You've got the presence of comedones, which is the main distinguishing feature in acne vulgaris, which is essentially these small non-inflammatory um, papules. You can either have them open or closed. Um, papules and pustules, so if they do become more inflammatory in nature, and if they become larger, then you get nodules and cysts, and finally scars, which can either be um, hypertrophic or depressed. Um, complications are scarring, but also psychological distress. So in a GP station, it'd be good to also let them know or assess the psychological impact. So in a typical GP station, with your explanation, it would be nice to dispel any myths. So let them know that fatty food is not a causative factor. Um, washing, more often, it's not going to make a difference. And hormones, um, people believe that it's due to an imbalance of hormones, but often the hormones are normal. So lifestyle modification is the first thing you want to let them know of that they can implement. So you would tell them to stop any aggravating medications or factors. So anabolic steroids, oral steroids as well. Um, lithium and phenytoin, those two medications cause or one of the side effects is acne, probably wouldn't stop it straight away, but you would review it. Um, and some oral contraceptive pills also um, make you more susceptible to acne. 
avoid any greasy sunscreens or moisturizers avoid like really hot humid conditions um, tell them to stop squeezing or picking the lesions because it can make the appearance worse than it actually is and avoid overwashing so normally you could just recommend like two times a day so management that will depend on the severity of the acne um, so with mild acne which is normally just comedones only or maybe some papules as well you just go um, topical retinoids and you can add in take, say a topical benzoyl peroxide or maybe even a topical antibiotic normally clindamycin so with mild topical retinoids plus or minus those other ones are mentioned with moderate you start considering more um, of your oral antibiotics which are used for the inflammatory effect so normally doxycycline um, but others include erythromycin and minocycline as well you let them know that it takes a while though um, and they'll probably have to be on it for at least three to six months. Um, and in females, um, they can also um, consider going on the combined oral contraceptive pill with an uh, anti-androgen um, within it. So that's normally cyproterone acetate. And whilst they're having the oral antibiotic, make sure um, they can continue the topical agent. They can continue the retinoid, the topical retinoid and the topical um, benzoyl peroxide as well. Um, if it's severe, in which case you would probably refer to a dermatologist, um, they can go on oral isotretinoin, which is associated with a few side effects. Um, so it's necessary to just be aware of them. The main one that might show up on MCQs is essentially teratogenicity. So if any females go on it, make sure they're also on um, contraception, oral contraceptive pill as well. Um, other side effects include severe dryness, um, so drying of the mucous membranes, drying of the eyes, um, raised lipids, um, and they say perhaps a slight chance of depression, but generally, generally it's quite safe and people would feel better having their acne treated. Okay, so... This is quite similar to acne. It looks quite similar, but there are some differences. I think the noise is a giveaway. Rosacea, yep. So rosacea is a chronic rash, more commonly seen in the middle-aged population rather than adolescents. Um, and essentially the main distinguishing feature of rosacea from acne is that there's no comedones in rosacea. So it's a chronic rash, an erythematous rash normally on the face. You get flushing, telangiectasia, you get papules as well. Um, it's more common in Celtic origin, so um, patients with fair skin and blue eyes, and often in middle-aged women. It's multifactorial in terms of its etiology, again with genetic, environmental, vascular and inflammatory factors um, and they say that UV radiation um, can also predispose or plays a role in its pathogenesis as well. Um, it's necessary to know the triggering factors so that you can warn the patient to avoid them. So that's like anything that causes flushing, um, so spicy foods, alcohol, and then anything that increases the heat So because that will increase the erythema, so hot showers, saunas, baths, hot drinks. So clinical features, as I mentioned before, you get papules, pustules, telangiectasia and erythema of the face, mostly on the cheeks, forehead, nose and chin. They call it an ace of club sign. Um, in rosacea, you don't get any comedones and you don't get scaling. You might have some lymphedema and hypertrophy of the subcutaneous tissues. And that's why, in, in, particularly in men, you get rhinophyma of the nose. Um, and because it's due to that hypertrophy of the subcutaneous tissues, unfortunately, the treatment for rosacea, the topical therapies and also the oral antibiotics that you use isn't going to necessarily treat the hypertrophy of the tissue and the rhinophyma that they get. Um, and they can have associated flushing, burning or stinging. And um, in, in children, they experience recurrent chalasia, whereas in adults, normally it can be associated with um, blepharoconjunctivitis as well. So management, um, reduced aggravating factors, 
So avoid spicy food, alcohol, all the triggers I mentioned before. Um, also let them know um, to just reduce any irritants. So just go with a mild soap-free cleanser. So you start off with topical metronidazole gel um, for six to 12 weeks, but if that isn't effective, then you move on to an, like an oral antibiotic such as doxycycline. Um, and in resistant cases, you can use low-dose isotretinoin. Um, and for the rhino farmer, as I mentioned before, the oral antibiotics isn't going to help that. So you can recommend um, CO2 laser or even just plastic surgery referral for that. Um, and unfortunately, even for the underlying telangiectasia and the underlying erythema, the oral antibiotics might not necessarily treat that. They might treat the papules, but not necessarily the redness. So um, if, if it's still resistant, you can consider vascular laser as well. So you've got um, papules surrounding the mouth, but there's that immediate sparing around immediately around the mouth region. And this is very characteristic of yeah, perioral dermatitis. Um, and what is what normally causes perioral dermatitis? What's the classical history of it? Normally secondary to um, like topical steroid application. Um, so it's a variant of rosacea. Um, and you get it mainly in women. So as I mentioned before, remember in the uh, management of rosacea, there isn't any use of topical steroids. It's just oral, um, oral doxycycline or metronidazole gel. But if you apply topical steroids, it's going to maybe treat it a little bit, but then it's going to get worse. And then when you stop the steroid, it will also increase the flare for a while as well. Um, so it causes that cycle that's very difficult to break. Um, and you get these papules and occasional pustules around the mouth, but immediate sparing around the skin bordering the lips. Um, so the treatment is you stop this topical steroids. Maybe let them know that it can get worse immediately, but ultimately it's a topical steroid that is making it um, worse and continuing um, those papules and those pustules. And you treat similarly to rosacea, so topical metronidazole and then oral doxycycline. So moving on to psoriasis now. So psoriasis, there's multiple forms of psoriasis, which I'll go through, but just in general, it's a chronic inflammatory skin condition um, characterized by well demarcated red scaly plaques, as opposed to eczema, which is more poorly demarcated. Um, classically, the, the description is salmon pink plaques with a silvery scale. So it affects two to 4% of males and females. Um, you've got this bimodal onset. Either you get it in your adolescence or you get it later on in life. Um, and it is a chronic condition, um, which is actually quite difficult to treat and contains a high morbidity, um, fluctuates in extent severity, and is triggered by multiple factors, including stress. Um, it's more common in Caucasians. So etiology and pathogenesis. There's a strong genetic component with psoriasis. Um, but unfortunately, it's not like autosomal dominant. There's no, there's no clear cut inheritance pattern. Um, and it's due to, the, they say it, it, it's due to the different um, signaling pathways between the T cells and the keratinocytes, which is where some of the tr newer treatments, um, the immunomodulators and the biologic agents target. And there's also, you also get epidermal hyperproliferation and accumulation of inflammatory cells. So in psoriasis, normally the epidermis turns over in a month, so four weeks, but in psoriasis it turns over every four days, which is why you get those thickened plaques. So in terms of the path, so, uh, pathology of psoriasis, you get thickening of the epidermis, so it causes um, acanthosis, absence of the granular cell layer, cell, cell layer, parakeratosis, which is essentially retention of the nuclei in the cells of the horny layer, Microabscesses, um, so um, neutrophils and pus in that um, granular and horny layer as well, and dilated capillary loops in the upper dermis. Um, comorbidities. So psoriatic arthritis occurs in um, could occur in up like they say up to thirty percent of patients. Got four different forms. Um, 
five, f five main forms. So single large joint arthritis, distal interphalangeal arthritis, rheumatoid-like arthritis mutilans, and also this spondylitis plus or minus sacroiliitis form. Metabolic syndrome is an important association with psoriasis and psoriasis confers like a two to three times risk of cardiovascular disease because it's an underlying chronic um, inflammatory disorder. So you've got that underlying inflammation consistently there. Um, now involvement as well. So you know, onycholysis, ridging and pitting. In terms of the different patterns, so classic plaque is what you would describe as the um, salmon pink plaques of the silvery scale. But you've also got scalp psoriasis um, that can be confused with seborrheic dermatitis, nail psoriasis when it affects the nails, guttate psoriasis often due to acute streptococcal throat infection, uh, flexural psoriasis, um, which is confusing because psoriasis normally affects the extensor regions, so the backs of the elbows, um, the knees, um, the buttocks, and the lower sacrum region. So, but you but you can get this flexural variety of psoriasis, um, brittle erythrodermic, acute pustula, chronic pomo, plantar pustulosis, and arthropathic psoriasis. So I'll go through some of the important ones to be able to spot diagnose. So this one's just your plain classic plaque psoriasis. Um, so I mentioned before, you've got the seven pink plaques of the silvery scale. Um, you've also got um, Olschbitz sign, which is essentially capillary point hemorrhage affects the extensor surfaces, it's symmetrical. The plaques tend to be chronic and stable. Um, and Kerbner phenomenon is essentially um, the predisposition of plaques in areas where you've had trauma or you've scratched. So it sort of looks like small round raindrops. So this one's, anyone? Yep, got it, psoriasis. Very common in adolescents, normally due to or secondary to an acute streptococcal throat infection. And treatment is UV radiation, essentially. So this this has been happening for a long, a longer time, and. Yep, yeah, and interestingly, the pustules are actually sterile. So um, you get these chronic sterile pustules on the hands um, and also the soles of the feet um, and typically starts off as erythematous patches, but then you get the development of those um, hyperpigmented brown lesions afterwards and then finally they peel off. Um, it's quite painful and uncomfortable, um, particularly because it's located on the hands and the feet, so um, significant morbidity and um, fortunately, it's quite difficult to treat, but they can have a trial of vitamin D analogs, so it's calcitriol, oral acetretin, um, but relapse is common. So this is the management for your basic um, classic plaque psoriasis, but the treatment for psoriasis or the different forms of treatment can often overlaps with the other, the other types as well. So... Again, starting with lifestyle modification, you want to avoid any aggravating factors. So stress, excess alcohol, smoking, and probably just let them know, um, be careful of trauma because of the Kerbner phenomenon. Regular emollients, um, salicylic acid containing wash um, to reduce the keratinocytes, and gentle sunshine exposure because we know that UV radiation helps with some forms of psoriasis. So again, you want to treat the active flare first, and you do that with moderate to strong topical steroids in pulses so two to three days per week um then stop um and then continue for a while until the flare decreases you can also use topical immunomodulators so pimacolomus and tacrolimus in the flexural areas in the face um, there are various other topical treatments as well um, that can be either used as adjuncts um, or form part of maintenance therapy so topical tar is um, something that's common in psoriasis. It has anti-inflammatory properties, but unfortunately there's an odour and it stings and will colour your clothes. Um, topical calcipatrial, which is the vitamin D analogue, um, that's the one which can be continued long term and it helps regulate um, proliferation and differentiation of keratinocytes. 
because it's a vitamin D analog, um, theoretically it can cause hypercalcemia. The other side effects include stinging and irritation, which is actually something you find across all of, all of the topical treatments, essentially. Dicerenol is the one which is most um, irritable, but it's also the one which is most effective and fastest in, reduce, in inducing remission. Um, causes this burn-like redness. Um, but because of its irritation, that can be the limiting factor for its use. Um, and tazarotene, so that can help reduce the hyperkeratotic plaques. Maintenance, as I mentioned before, you probably just continue the cast of the trial long term. You might still need a little bit of topical steroids on the weekend, but you would definitely reduce the amount and the dose. Um, phototherapy can be used as an adjunct, but it's a highly time time consuming activity where you require three treatments in a week, 24 times. Um, and systemic therapy. So you've got um, oral agents such as methotrexate, acetretin, and cyclosporin. There's a range of biologics for psoriasis now, which are quite effective. They essentially target either TNF alpha inhibitors or um, certain cytokines. So the, the list is up there. Probably, classically, you probably just need to know the top three. And the, the last three are ones which are newer. So the top three are also coincidentally the TNF alpha inhibitors. Um, but all of them are um, injections. Um, it's important to assess the psychological impact and their severity scales like the PASI score and also to let them know about increased risk in cardiovascular disease, so um, lifestyle modification with SNAPW. All right, so we'll move on to infections now and all of these ones I have are bacterial. This is a superficial infection caused by Staph aureus, often in children. Yep, impetigo. So impetigo, um, as I mentioned before, it's a superficial infection. So often one of the different types of bacterial infection is generally caused by Staph aureus. Um, but the way to differentiate it is how deep the infection is, whether it's just confined to the epidermis, whether it goes down to the dermis, or whether it actually invades the subcutaneous tissues as well. So with um, impetigo, it's generally it's just quite superficial. Um, you get these honey-crusted lesions, um, also known as school sores, which you can use um, in your GP stations to explain to parents, and most commonly occurring in children, especially boys, and peak onset during the summer, um, so in hotter conditions. Predisposing factors, so I guess anything that results in damage to the skin's barrier function, like atopic dermatitis, scabies because you're constantly itching, skin trauma. There are two forms to be aware of, so non-bullous, which is more common, and then the bullous impetigo, where you get um, large, fluctuant bulli um, that evolve from these small vesicles and they can, and they can burst. Um, in terms of, yeah, so in terms of the cause, the other thing to note is that non-bullous can be caused by Staph aureus, but also um, strep pyogenes, whereas the bullous form is generally just Staph aureus. So with treatment, um, you've got your basic things like clean the wound and everything, but essentially um, topical mupirocin, so that's a topical antibiotic used to treat um, the infection. And that's if it's localised, if it's widespread, just go with oral antibiotics. So either cephalexin, which is often used in kids, or it's more severe than flucloxacillin. Um, and then other general basic things like before that, you would cleanse the wound with normal saline. You can treat it with some antiseptic and afterwards to prevent recurrence. Um, if they do have recurring episodes, you want to test for nasal carriage of Staph aureus, and if so, they can get um, topical mupirocin applied intranasally. Um, they can also get washes like bleach paths as well and prevent spread. So avoid close contact, avoid um, school until all the crusts have out. Use separate towels and make sure you wash clothes and linen daily. Complications, so soft tissue infection, so cellulitis, so it can, the infection can track down deeper. But also because it's staph aureus, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome. If it's due to strep, um, if it's the non bullous form and it's due to strep, then you can get post-strep GN and also rheumatic fever.
So this is more of a superficial infection around the hair follicle. And you can see that the pustules that are there in the middle, all of them have like a hair follicle coming out of it. So that's the main way you tell what that rash or those pustules are. So from that, do you know what sort of diagnosis been primarily looking at? Yep, folliculitis. Again, it's more with, uh, it's more of a that superficial infection around the hair follicle, and then it causes those pustules um, that are all centered on the follicle. So you can see the hair coming out of it. Normally, staph aureus, um, and the treatment. So the other thing is that um, folliculitis might also be caused by um, irritants and occlusion. Um, but generally, if, since we're talking about bacterial infections, um, Staph aureus would be the most common bacterial cause of it. Treatment, so it might settle by itself, particularly if it's due to that irritant or occlusion. Um, but if it's due to an infection, then topical mupericin and if extensive oral antibiotics. So this is a deeper infection of the hair follicle. So this is a boil or furuncle. Um, so it's sort of similar to an abscess. Um, similar cause, so staph aureus, but now it's just tracked down deeper um, into the um, hair follicle itself. Um, treatment because of that is flucoxacillin. So if it's small, you can also just incise it and drain the pustule and the abscess that way. So we see multiple sort of areas all coming together, groups of adjacent follicles combining and forming this one large <laughs> nodule. This is a carbuncle. So again, it's a deep infection, but now you've got adjacent hair follicles all combining into one, um, commonly on the nape of the neck and in middle to elderly men associated with diabetes and um, it's essentially, you know, it starts off as a dome shaped area of tender erythema, but then you might get pus discharging from the lesion later. Um, and because it's a deep infection, you treat with flucoxacillin. So I'd say the borders for this erythematous rash are poorly defined. So that can give a clue as to which layer it's affecting. Cellulitis, yep, so um, infection of the subcutaneous tissue with often streptococcus, um, but other causes include staph and haemophilus. In haemophilus less so nowadays because of immunization. Um, so you've got the diffuse, poorly defined tender erythema associated with swelling, normally just unilaterally in the lower limb. Um, predisposing factors, so past history and anything that breaks the barrier of the skin allowing that infection to track. Um, differentials. So with cellulitis, it's often confused with many other things. Um, so common differentials to just be aware of include like venous stasis, uh, DVT, um, erythema nodosum, contact dermatitis, acute lipodermatosclerosis, septic bursitis, and gout. And if it's ever bilateral, then you probably need to rethink that your diagnosis of cellulitis. Uh, mild to early cellulitis can be treated with oral antibiotics, where if, um, whereas if it's severe, then we would just go IV. So the location is important here. So it's commonly on the face. And the other thing is that a buzzword is like butterfly rash. Not, not lupus though. <laughs> um, and it's well demarcated. So those are the buzzwords. It's also more superficial than cellulitis, affecting the dermis. So this is erysipelas. Um, so it's infection of the dermis, and the dermis being an area which has a lot of structures within it um, is quite tightly confined, so it will produce the well-demarcated lesion as opposed to the subcutaneous tissue infection. Um, and normally erysipelas occurs on the face, causing that butterfly-like rash. Um, and the other buzzword is that you get this sharp red raised edge. Um, so you would still treat with oral antibiotics, and if it's MRSA, then obviously bank. 
So you've got two forms there. There's the acute form and then the chronic infection around the nail bed. So, yep, paronychial. So otherwise known as Whitlow, you can have two forms, acute or chronic. Acute most likely due to infection. Um, and chronic... So it's a chronic inflammatory process. You might have some infection as well, but more often polymicrobial. So with the acute form, you get that um, tenderness around the nail bed. And you might see a pustule around the nail bed as well, or a little abscess. Um, and then the chronic form, so it's often due to maceration. So when the hands are repeatedly immersed in water. So acute, so if it's just small, you can drain the pustule um, uh, with a sterile needle. Otherwise, topical mupirocin if it's quite localised and quite mild, or oral flucloxacillin if it's still not settling with that. And chronic paronychia, so you want to treat the lifestyle and the personal measures first by trying to keep the hands um, dry, using gloves um, and keeping the fingernails clean, um, improving the barrier of the skin by applying regular emollients, um, topical anti-candida um, therapy because that's that might be an um, organism that's um, involved in chronic paronychia but again mentioned it's it's quite polymicrobial so you might um, also need to treat um, with other topical antibiotics and topical steroids as well because it's underlying chronic inflammation. So viral So there's various forms here. I think the most obvious one is probably the one on the second and last one where you've got these pinpoint dot capillary hemorrhages. Yep, so what's? So um, they're essentially epidermal neoplasms um, caused by HPV, as mentioned, and you've got various different types of warts occurring on different locations, but it's very common in children um, and also in immunosuppressed individuals and it's spread by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. So if you get plantar warts, it's often because you're walking along um, the floor of swimming pools and so then you get contact with the virus that way. Um, and in incubation period can be up to 12 months. So common warts are, the, the buzzword is cauliflower-like papules with a rough um, hyperkeratotic surface, most frequently on the hands. Plantar warts, as mentioned before, that's when you get them on, on the feet. Um, and normally there's numerous small little dot pinpoint hemorrhages. Um, and also you get them either scattered or grouped in a mosaic pattern. Plain warts, so plain telling us the morphology being flat topped. Um, and they're commonly found on the face and the hands. Um, they might occur in a line if you if you scratch and then so you auto inoculate that way. Filiform warts, so again telling us about the the form of it. It's a long stalk and thread like digitate wart, also commonly on the face. And mucosal warts, so this includes um, genital warts. Um, okay, so with treatment, you can just watch and wait for it to settle, particularly in a small child where the other treatments might be quite irritating. Um, and might cause scarring. So you can watch and wait, um, but there are also various other topical treatments you can try. So you can try wart paints, which contain salicylic acid. You can try topical pedophilotoxin or pedophilin, um, topical amiquimod, normally both for genital warts. And then for plain warts, topical tretinoin. Cryotherapy can be used, but probably not on the face. Um, and also, generally only if it's not responsive to wart paints, although it is used for plantar warts. Um, and multiple treatments are often required. Curatage and cautery, particularly if the warts are pedunculated and large. Um, uh, pulse dye laser deduction as well um, of those capillaries that feed or continue to um, feed that wart and the, and the virus. It's pearly papule umbilicated. Often in children, transmitted in swimming pools. Yeah, molluscum contagiosum. So it's caused by Pox virus. 
Um, as I mentioned before, you get these clusters of epidermal papules. They're often pearly in colour. Uh, often in children, warm climates, overcrowded environments. Um, so with, the, with how you would describe it, it's a pearly pink papule with an umbilicated uh, core filled with a keratin plug. And that's something that you can actually physically express, um, which is one of the treatments. Um, frequently grouped together. Um, and if you've got atopic eczema, you're more likely to get it extensive. Um, lesions can occur anywhere on the body. So transmission, direct skin to skin contact, um, but also indirect contact by shared towels, auto inoculation, sexual transmission in adults. Commonly you'll see like the child who goes for a swim and then after that develops these lesions. Um, an incubation period is about two weeks, but it can be up to six months. So management. So either it's self-limiting because you don't want to do anything to irritate it further and that's also in a kid, or you can try these other treatments. So you can physically try to um, express the core of the lesion. You can do tape occlusion. Um, you can do cryotherapy, probably only on, on the limbs. Um, curatage and laser ablation. Medical treatment, so topical imiquimod, topical pedophilin, um, topical cantharidin, um, wart paints as well. And don't forget to give them general advice about preventing spread. So the spots in the mouth might not be really visible, but they're meant to be tiny. You can sort of see tiny white spots there. And then the rash is on the trunk that develops after these spots you get in the mouth. And you also get conjunctivitis and you get a cough. You get carousal symptoms. It's highly contagious. So measles. <laughs> so classically, the rash, they say, progresses um, carefully quarterly, where it starts behind the ear and then goes down the trunk. Um, and you get the rash on day three. So there's a clear progression of symptoms. Um, Coplic spots appears be appear before the actual rash in the trunk, though. And in terms of the rash, so described as macular papula erythematous morbilliform. Transmission is by airborne respiratory droplets. So if anybody coughs or sneezes in the air, then anybody who breathes <coughs> in that can essentially contract measles. Um, and contagious, so it's sometimes good to know, well, it's quite good to know when it's contagious. So then you know whether the child can go to school or not, but essentially two days before the symptoms and five days after the rash. And incubation is 10 to 11 days. Um, and treatment is like symptomatic because it's just viral. Yeah, so I always find this image funny because the kids look strangely happy. <laughs> and then you've got the reticular rash that develops after. So slap cheek, otherwise known as erythema infectiosum, um, this disease as well. So parvovirus B19, which is a virus um, that you should know is associated with this or causes this. You get the classic slap cheek appearance. Sometimes that disappears though and all you see is the reticular rash. Um, so you get the slap cheek before the reticular rash and the rash can persist to up, up to six days, uh, up to six weeks, sorry. Um, interestingly, once the rash appears, you're no longer infectious um, and you can also get just normal carousal symptoms as well. Um, transmission respiratory droplets and incubation of seven to 10 days. And just have to be careful in um, pregnant women because it can cause anemia. Yep, that was really straightforward. So again, it's due to um, know the viruses for these classic um, viral exanthems. So this one's Coxsackie virus, A16. Um, and you get small gray vesicles on the hands um, and the feet. And then in the mouth, you can get these ulcers that resemble aptus ulcers, which make it really difficult for the child to um, drink and eat. Um, so so in terms of treatment, you're just going to be supporting them through that, encourage regular fluids, encourage rest. Um, 
the the so the the papule the macules and the papules can occur also on the buttocks which is something not in the, in the name but also important to know so the buttocks genitalia and sometimes the arms as well and self-resolving two two weeks um so sort of see vesicles bursted vesicles on the trunk it's quite widespread and it's highly pruritic yep varicella so um, varicella is um, caused by a chicken pox uh, oh also known as chicken pox caused by varicella zoster um, it presents a general malaise fever and an itchy erythematous papular vas vesicular rash on the head and trunk um, the lesions heal over a week and may scar, and the blisters can also arise in the mouth. I think the main thing to know about varicella is when it's contagious. So it's one, one to two days before um, the rash, and then once all the lesions have crossed it over, because that's when you would tell the child to probably just stay home, um, keep the child at home. Um, and incubation is 10 to 21 days. Normally it's just symptomatic treatment. However, if it's in adults, it can be more severe. So you will start oral antivirals. So was, this guy got a burning sensation over his trunk a few days before and then developed this rash. Yep. So shingles, herpes zoster, also caused by varicella zoster virus. Um, it's quite common. So it's more common in like middle aged to elderly people, more common in immunosuppressed individuals. It's due to the reactivation of varicella zoster from the dorsal root ganglion. Um, you get the blistering eruption of group vesicles along the dermatome, not crossing over to the other side. Um, and you might get the painful burning sensation before the rash appears. This is herpes simplex. So painful grouped vesicles um, very frequently occurring around the mouth, so gingivose stomatitis. But you can also get HSV too, which is more commonly associated um, with genital herpes. Although HSV1 and HSV2, it's not like HSV1 has to occur on the mouth. There can be quite a bit of crossover as well. But classically, HSV1 for gingivose st um, stomatitis and HSV2 genital herpes. Um, so normally for a primary infection, you don't need to really treat it, but if it becomes recurrent, you might need some low dose, um, topical antivirals or oral antivirals as well. So you've got Herald patch. <laughs> Yeah, and also that's meant to resemble like a Christmas tree or fir tree pattern. So pityriasis rosea is a self-limiting viral rash, um, lasting about 6 to 12 weeks. Again, treatment is self-limiting, so it's just symptomatic. If it's really itchy, you can prescribe some topical steroids. Um, otherwise, it'll resolve by itself. Um, classic description is that herald patch which is a large two to five centimeter patch that appears normally on the trunk. And then following that, um, one to two weeks later, you get more smaller sort of um, pink over oval patches. The other buzzword being that the patches have this colorectal scale where the scale peels off from the middle outwards. Um, and they occur in a Christmas tree pattern. So as mentioned, self-resolving because it's a viral topical emollients and if it's really itchy, then you can use some topical steroids as well. So moving on to fungal infections. Tinea, I think I heard. So tinea can infect different parts of the body. So you have tinea pedis there, tinea corporis, tinea manum. So tinea, it's caused by a dermatophyte infection. And there's very different, various different species and types. Um, some more associated with the different form of tinea that you get. So with tinea pedis, often it affects either between the third and the fourth or the fourth and the fifth. And it'll cause like an itchy area or even erosion of the skin there. Um, 
And actually, tinea peters can be a predisposing factor for um, a more serious infection such as cellulitis. Um, it's often, often um, co um, contracted by contact with infected keratin on the floors of swimming pools. Um, and um, you can also get this moccasin version of tinea pedis where you get extensive involvement of the soles and the sides. Tinea cruris is when it infects uh, the groin region and classically it's described as the scaly spreading erythematous rash that goes down the medial aspects of the thighs. The source is often from tinea pedis. Um, tinea corporis, in, in contrast, it causes these annular lesions, classically with central sparing and a spreading peripheral edge with scale. Um, and it's relatively uncommon, but it'll, it'll affect the trunk, the legs, or the arms. Tinea manum, so it might be like one hand, two foot disease. So this is when it affects normally just a palm, but there'll be um, either like mild scaling erythema or more obvious well demarcated um, erythema if it's the dorsum of the hand. Tinea unguim, so that's or onychomycosis is when it affects the nail, normally just causing like a widespread yellow brittle nail. Um, generally starts laterally as a single longitudinal band and then progresses. Um, tinea capitis, that will cause patchy baldness, but the scalp is otherwise normal. And the patchy baldness um, will result in these black dots due to the break, a breakage of the, the hair um, shaft just at the scalp. Um, and either the fungus can actually infect the hair, the hair itself or it can just be outside. Um, carry-on is when you get this large um, postular collection, sort of like an abscess, um, normally on the scalp and normally caused by um, zoophilic dermatophytes so, um, from cats. Um, Fabus, it's another distinctive type of tinea capitis with yellow cup-shaped crusts. Um, and tinea incognito, which I mentioned before, was when you apply topical steroids to um, an area of fungal infection. Um, and then it changes the appearance of tinea, um, makes it more ill-defined and makes it sort of like a patchy, scaly erythema instead. With the investigation, so you either scrape the edge of the lesion um, and then um, take that as your sample, or you can pull the hair out if you're suspecting tinea capitis. You can use nail clippings for onychomycosis and also wood's light. Um, with woods light, it only causes fluorescence in some species. So it's not all forms of tinea would, would necessarily fluoresce on woods light. Um, so treatment, again, if it's localised, you can stick to just your top, um, topical antifungals. But if it's extensive, then you would choose an oral antifungal agent. Um, so it's necessary to know the indication. So either widespread or extensive, if it hasn't responded to topical steroids, if it's already been treated with topical um, corticosteroids, oh, if it hasn't responded to topical therapy, sorry, if it's been treated with topical steroids, if it's recurrent. Um, also, if it's on the scalp, palms or soles, it's probably not going to be affected by the topical treatment itself um, due to the thickening of the skin there. Um, and also, if it's inflammatory, hyperkeratotic, or vesicular, then you probably need to have oral, oral antifungals. Um, and I've got the treatments listed there. So, this rash, it can either be hyperpigmented in fair skinned individuals or hypopigmented in darker skinned individuals. And on microscopy, you get this classical spaghetti and meatballs pattern. Yep. Yep. So, as mentioned before, because it's either hypo or hypopigmented, that's why you got the name versicolor. Um, and this is caused by Malassezia yeasts, which is a fungal infection. Um, so, either hyperpigmented macules with a fine branny surface scale um, or patchy hypopigmentation. Um, fortunately, this infection tends to recur. Um, so, investigation. You mix the skin scrapings with, with, with potassium hydroxide and then you examine it um, under microscopy and you get the spaghetti and meatballs appearance. 
um, as seen before. And it can also fluoresce yellow green as well. So because it's due to malassezia yeast, you treat it with selenium sulfide shampoo and you can apply that onto the skin for a few minutes, um, probably for a week or two, um, and hopefully by then it will resolve. Um, other treatments include your other antifungals, so ketoconazole shampoo or topical antifungals. And if it's extensive, if it's not responding to topical therapy, then you choose um, oral antifungals. So this one. Scabies, yeah. So scabies, you get the classical mite or the burrow patterns caused by the mite. And then after that, you get that hypersensitivity reaction, um, which causes the more generalized rash on your trunk. So it's spread by direct skin to skin or person to person contact by the mite, Psychoptes scabii, often um, like say an adult holding a child's hand and it can transmit that way. Um, and pathogenesis is basically the females, um, there, there'll only be a, about a dozen of the actual burrows on the skin. Um, but what causes the rash is the hypersensitivity reaction afterwards. So you get that intensely pruritic skin with irregular, slightly scaly burrows. It's seen often in the finger webs, on the wrists, the ankles, medial and lateral borders of the feet, um, and papules on the penis. Each burrow is several millimetres long. Um, normally de they describe it as tortuous, and then you'll have a ves vesicle at the end where the mite actually sits. Um, as mentioned before, the rash is an allergic reaction. Um, and you can, um, due to all the scratching, you can get secondary, um, a secondary eczematous rash that can occur a few weeks after the treatment. Um, and in immunosuppressed people, you can get have, like massive infestation causing noise and scabies. For the investigation, you try to find a burrow, um, keeping in mind that there are probably less than a dozen. And then you do a skin scraping at the end of the burrow looking for the mite or trying to get the mite and then examine it under the microscope. Um, treatment is permethrin 5% cream applied from the neck down, although in babies and um, people from central or northern Australia would apply it to the face as well because scabies affects that area um, in that epidemiology. But normally skin to neck down, I tell them to apply it under the nails and nail brush as well. Um, leave it on overnight and then they can wash it off in the morning. So that's one treatment done and then a week later they'll need to repeat that treatment again. And after they've had both treatments then they can go back to school. Um, and then other things include, you know, treating close contacts, um, making sure you wash all your clothes. If you can't wash something then um, storing it in a plastic um, bag because um, the mites can't actually survive outside of a human host. Um, and if it's resistant then oral ivermectin. really gross. Let's just move on to so head lice. So um, head lice um, can occur and it could be a GP station. Um, essentially um, it's just due to that the wingless insect um, from head to head contact essentially called uh, Pediculus humanus fari capitis. It's very common in children um, what happens is they lay the eggs on the shaft and you only actually see the shaft after the, the like after the knit emerges from, from the, the shaft, from the case. Um, then, you, then it makes it more visible on the head. Um, so, and you get pruritus and irritation in the scalp. So investigation, you examine the scalp, you try to look for knits, you try to look for any live, um, I guess, lice crawling around. Um, you can do wet combing where you use like a fine tooth comb with conditioner and just comb through and then wipe off the conditioner on like uh, a piece of paper and then look for the nits that way. Treatment similar to um, scabies, you would use similar um, topical scabicides. So 1% permethrin, um, which can come in the form of shampoos um, applied to the head once, so 20 minutes, and then, or you can use 0.5% moldicin for eight hours. So that's one treatment. In between those, after that treatment, you should keep doing your wet combing and then you should repeat the treatment again one week later. Um, wash all pillowcases, combs, brushes and hot water and 
notify the school and also treat close contacts. Okay, so moving on to benign and malignant skin tumours. So it looks like a stuck on sultanal. So right, keratosis, yep. So basal cell papillomas, they're benign, um, but if they do cause diagnostic confusion or they're excised and sent to histology, because they're worried about it being something more um, severe um, or malignant, but they're benign and they don't actually, they don't actually progress to malignant lesions. Um, they're very common on elderly patients, often occurring on the trunk um, and typically um, occur like 90% of adults over 60 years have one or more. So the classical description is essentially like a stuck on appearance, stuck on sultana. And you get this waxy surface, often pigmented, greasy looking. You get a granular surface with pits in it as well. Um, and as mentioned before, they can arrive on any area of the skin. Treatment. So you just leave it alone or if you want to remove it, then cryotherapy. Puritage and cautery, um, ablative laser, shave biopsy, or excision as well. This has been a fairly stable lesion over time. Solar keratosis. So solar keratoses are areas of dysplastic squamous epithelium without invasion. So they're just dysplastic cells, but they don't necessarily confer to an SCC as such. They have a low grade progression to SCC, like less than 0.1%. Um, but they represent long uh, exposure to UV radiation. Um, so in terms of the clinical features, um, it's erythematous, it's scaly, it's a crusted patch, classically waxes and wanes. And by that, I mean, like, if you don't expose yourself to the sun, it can actually spontaneously remit. Um, it can present as a cutaneous horn. Um, it can be asymptomatic or itch. The site's often sun-exposed areas because it's due to cumulative UV radiation. Um, but if it's tender, thickened, ulcerating or enlarging, then it's more suspicious of an SCC. The progression, though, is still quite low. Treatment. So the first line therapy is usually cryotherapy. Um, you can also use the other forms of physical um, treatment like curatide and cautery, uh, shave excision as well. But there are also some medical treatments, so topical 5-fluorouracil um, cream, which is an anti-cytotoxic agent, topical imiquimod cream, um, topical 3% diclofenac gel, um, and make sure you advise them about sun protection. Um, so this lesion is in the epidermis, but it hasn't invaded anywhere else. Sorry? Um, no. Yes, SSC in situ, I heard, also known as Bolan's disease. So this is just still in the intra-epidermis. Um, but it is an SCC, so, um, like, it just hasn't invaded further. Um, with Bowen's disease, they describe it as a solitary, well-defined, persistent patch. It's often on the lower limbs of elderly women, um, and it's generally asymptomatic. It can progress to ACC, uh, SCC, sorry. Um, so treatment, so again, quite similar to um, the other one. Um, quite similar to solar keratosis, where you've got liquid nitrogen, um, cryotherapy, topical 5-fluorouracil, topical amicumab, surgical excision. You can also do photodynamic therapy, where you apply um, a photosensitizing cream to the face, and then you expose them to UV radiation, and that irritates it and causes a local immune response to kill the cells. Um, and radiotherapy as well can be used. So this one is more malignant looking. This one's an SCC. So it's the second most common skin cancer. Does anyone know what the most common skin cancer is? Yep, BCC. So SCC is second most common. Um, risk factors, as I mentioned before, it's that long-term exposure 
to um, UV radiation. Whereas later on, we'll talk about a lesion which is more associated with intermittent high dose exposure. So clinical features are that indurated, crusted and nodular ulcerated lesion. And the main um, distinguishing feature is that it will enlarge over weeks to months. So it's changing. Um, it's often tender or painful because it's invading the lower tissues. Um, and you can have different classification. So poorly, moderately and well differentiated tumours. If it's well differentiated, it's more likely to produce keratin. So you might get that scaling more, whereas if it's poorly differentiated, then you might not get any scaling and might look like an, um, a melanotic, melanoma. Um, and often on sun exposed areas, so ear, lips, hands and scalp. The treatment, if you know, if you think, suspect that it's a lesion that's enlarging, you just try to just excise the whole lesion. Um, so you do wide surgical excision with a three to 10 millimeter margin. But there are also other treatments you can consider like curatage and cautery, shave excision, cryotherapy. Mohs micrographic surgery is essentially a, a really long surgical procedure um, that's quite accurate in getting um, the lesion completely. Um, in, they take horizontal sections and then um, they examine it under a microscope, see if there's any dysplastic cells. If there are, they go back, find the border and continue to excise. And so because they're reviewing it, on the spot, they can actually get the whole lesion completely and really define the borders of the lesion. Um, radiotherapy, if the tumour is inoperable, so if the patient isn't suitable for surgery. This is something you actually, that actually will come up in an EMQ as a spot diagnosis. Yeah, keratoacanthoma. So classically that volcano-like lesion with the central keratin plug. Um, so tumours, round and rolled edges, you get that plug in the middle and the base is often erythematous, inflamed and painful. Keratoacanthomas are interesting because their the, the histology closely resembles SEC um, and, but strangely the lesions also shrink and disappear. Um, so with the treatment, you either watch and wait and let itself resolve, or if you're unsure as to whether it is something like an SCC, then you would just go and excise it. This is BCC. Um, any takers for the various forms? Yep. So morphic, morphic and also ulcerative is shown there. So I've got the forms later, but essentially BCC is the most common malignant skin tumour also due to long-term exposure to UV radiation. Um, classically, it's different from SCC in that you don't get that crusting and induration. You now get a more pearly, um, translucent lesion um, with telangiectasia is the other buzzword and the classical rolled edge. Um, Metastasis with BCC is extremely rare, although you can get quite local invasion, um, such as like causing ul ulceration in that region, so it can still be quite disfiguring. Um, predominantly on sun exposed areas, such as the face, um, hair bearing scalp behind the ear on the trunk. Um, you should be aware of the clinical variants. Um, so you can get nodular, which essentially just looks like a nodule. Um, central depression, rolled edge, telangiectasia, pearly surface, superficial, which looks somewhat similar to an SCC, um, where you get this sort of lesion that goes on for years, um, and it can and it's more not it's not raised as such; it's more just flat and it's centimeters across. Morphoic is scar-like, so it's actually quite difficult with these lesions to know where it starts and where it ends. And pigmented is essentially when you've got hyperpigmentation. Treatment, so surgical excision, um, most micrographic surgery as mentioned before, curatage and cautery, radiotherapy, cryotherapy, but also the other forms of treatment such as PDT, and you can still use the topical 5 fluorouracil and also the imiquimod, which is not available for SEC.
quite a few different forms there. So the first one looks like a classical form of, yep, superficial spreading. And the second one is affecting the nails. More common in dark skinned individuals, not really related to UV radiation. Aquil antigenous. Yep. And then the last one, it's like dome shaped. It's got the worst prognosis. Yep. So malignant melanoma arises from the melanocytes. Um, often it occurs de novo, so from a new lesion rather than from like a existing lentigo um, or a melanocytic nevi. And it occurs at any age in adults. Um, risk factors, so UV exposure is the obvious one, but the other one with melanoma is just large numbers of melanistic nevi. Um, they generally say like 50 to 100, but also 20, more than 25 still confers a risk, and the more you've got, the greater the risk. Um, large congenital nevi is the other risk, and then you've also got this various genetic associations. Um, and features, you should probably know the American features um, of melanoma, which is A, B, C, D, E, so asymmetry, border irregularity, colour variation, diameter more than six, and evolution. Um, and for dysplastic nevi, it's essentially the same thing, except the diameter is more than five, and if it's more than three out of five, then it's considered dysplastic. Um, so clinical patterns, so superficial spreading melanoma is the most common. Um, and it's the lesion that we saw before with that irregularly pigmented brown or black patch um, with the classical features of A, B, C, D, E, so irregular edge, um, variation in colour, evolution over time. It's associated with intermittent intense sun exposure. So this means that it's more um, found in like indoor workers and it's also in areas where, which are only intermittently exposed to the sun. Whereas lentigo malignant melanoma is almost the opposite, where it's due to cumulative sun exposure. So areas which are chronically exposed to the sun and therefore also found in um, outdoor workers. Um, it's unevenly pigmented and because it's more chronic exposure, it's more commonly on the face and you get that Hutchinson, Hutchinson's freckle sign. Um, nodular melanoma is the worst prognosis because you don't have a radial growth phase and immediately from the beginning, it has that vertical growth phase. Um, so it will cause deeper invasion um, and greater likelihood of metastasis. Um, and then finally, acral lentiginous melanoma, which is the one found in dark skinned individuals, um, not really related to UV radiation and acral lentiginous meaning like it's more likely on the sole or the palms. Um, so the most important thing about melanoma, I guess, is in regards to prognosis would be the thickness. So Breslow's thickness is um, used for, for that classification. Clark level is more associated with the, how far it's invaded into the, into the skin, how deep it's invaded, which layer it goes into. Um, and in terms of predicting tumours, generally they say, so Clark level is useful for thin tumours, but Breslow is better for thicker tumours. So treatment, you want to try to excise it. So you would do a primary excision just for the histology. And once you've got the histology, um, you, can, you might need to go back and do a wider margin. And the wider margin will depend on how thick the tumour is. Um, if you palpate the lymph nodes are enlarged, then um, you might need to go forward with a sentinel lymph node biopsy and maybe even... Um, surgery there. Um, but another recommendation is that if the melanoma thickness is more than one millimeter, then you would also still consider a sentinel node biopsy, even if they aren't enlarged. Um, metastatic mel melanoma can be treated with vario, various um, chemotherapy agents, so immunotherapy, RAF inhibitors, there's plenty. Um, and it's important to have regular follow up, self skin examination, tell them about sun protection, um, and continue that at least for the next five years. something you might encounter in paediatric dermatology. Um, sorry? Dementia. Yep. So either the child, the child generally develops it very early on, the first few months of life. It'll actually get worse 
but then it will self-resolve. Um, so childhood angiomas, hemangiomas, um, infantile hemangiomas, um, strawberry nevi, so various names, they're characterised by a presence of actively growing and dividing vascular tissue. Um, and they arise in the immediate postnatal period. As I mentioned, they'll often get worse, but then they do self-resolve. Um, so the general rule of thumb is 70% by the age of seven, 50% by the age of five. Um, so management in that situation, because it's going to self-resolve, would be expectant. But there are some exceptions to that. So that's if it's bleeding, um, if, the, if it's the bleeding um, is severe um, or if feeding is obstructed, such as if it's around the mouth, um, if the tumour occludes the eye, because that can cause amblyopia, um, or if it continues after 10 years old. And the treatment for that is propanolol, um, high-dose prednisolone, or surgical intervention. So I think that's it. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to turn off. Okay, just unplug everything. We do it. Good job. That is really helpful. Thank you. Very Okay. Oh, several yeah. windows yeah. open for the hangout thing. We just have to turn that off. And then just stop broadcast.